Good afternoon and welcome everybody to today's seminar on sustainable development. As you could see from the announcement, it is on the topic of food security in Cuba. It's my great pleasure to introduce our three distinguished presenters to you. The session will be moderated by Jose Fernandez. And he is partner in the New York office of law office of uh, Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. He's also co-chair of Gibson, Dunn's Latin America practice group. In that, uh, in his role at the law firm, he focuses on mergers and acquisitions and finance in emerging markets in Latin America, the Middle East, Africa and Asia. He's probably best known for his role in the Obama cabinet. He was nominated by President Obama and unanimously confirmed by the Senate. Uh, imagine that uh, in today's uh, environment. You know that that alone is is uh, something that distinguishes him. Um, and he was sworn in as Assistant Secretary of State for Economic, Energy, and Business Affairs in 2009. He had an almost four-year tenure in this position, during which uh, his work focused on development of business opportunities for US companies as a strategic imperative for the United States, mostly in the areas of infrastructure, trade and investment, entrepreneurship and agriculture, the topic of today's seminar. Uh, prior to uh, joining the State Department, Mr. Fernandez practiced law for over 25 years when he concentrated during this time on emerging markets. He uh, got his uh, degree from uh, Dartmouth College and started out there in history. And then he earned a doctoral degree in law from the Columbia University uh, School of Law. And uh, here he also received the Charles Evans U Prize and the Parker School Certificate of International law with honors. He will, after his remarks, we will hear from Pedro Sanchez, who many of you know. He is the director of the Agriculture and Food Secu Security Center, formerly the Tropical Agriculture Center. And he's also a senior research scholar at the Earth Institute. He served as director general of the World Agro Agroforestry Center, uh, ICRAF, which is headquartered in Nairobi in uh, Kenya between 1991 and 2001. He also served as co-chair of the United Nations Millennium Project Hunger Task Force and he held this position between 2002 and 2005. And finally, he was the director of the Millennium Villages Project. Many of you have heard about that project between 2004 and 2010. Before coming to Colombia, Pedro held uh, positions as a pro uh, in soil science and forestry at North Carolina State University. I think he's still a professor emeritus there. And uh, he was leading the tropical soils research program there. He has lived in many parts of the world, including the Philippines, Peru, Colombia and Kenya. And he supervised research programs in over 25 countries in these continents. He has written books and many scholarly articles on soil science and hunger. He serves on many boards, has received three honorary degrees and decorations from universities and governments. So, you, I mean, those of you who know Pedro are not uh, surprised about that, but you can see how widely his um, work actually reaches. In 2002, he received the World Food Prize. In 2004, he was named a MacArthur uh, Fellow, this got the so-called Genius Award. And he also was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and to the National Academy of Sciences. Among the uh, accolades he got was one that said that his work uh, influenced research in agronomy, ecology and change the way technology is used to increase food production. I think that's a, a very important accomplishment. 
After Pedro, we will hear from Cheryl, Cheryl Palm. She's a senior research scientist and director of research in the what we call Ag Center. Uh, she's a tropical ecologist and biogeochemist, and her research focuses on land use change, degradation and rehabilitation, and ecosystem processes in tropical agricultural landscapes. Cheryl has spent much of the past 15 years investigating soil nutrient dynamics in farming systems of Africa, including options for soil and land rehabilitation. Her most recent work investigates the trade-offs and synergies among agricultural intensification strategies, the environment, and rural livelihoods. She's the, the Deputy Director of Vital Science Africa, a new project developing and implementing integrated monitoring systems in agricultural landscapes. Cheryl received her PhD in soil science from North Carolina State University after she completed her bachelor's and master's degrees in zoology at the University of California, Davis. She then served as principal research scientist of the uh, Tropical Soil Biology and Fertility Program in Nairobi, Kenya, and held this position from 1991 to 2001. Overall, she served on many faculties, including North Carolina State faculty, uh, Universities, Colorado State University, and she spent a year as visiting scientist at the University of California, Berkeley. She's a fellow of the, the American Society of Aqu Aqu Agronomists and served as chair of the International Nitrogen Initiative between 2008 and 2011. So please welcome our speakers. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Jose to the podium to introduce the session. Good afternoon, and thank you, Peter, uh, for that introduction. Uh, what Peter forgot to mention is that the reason I was unanimously confirmed uh, by the Senate is that they refused to meet. Uh, this is DC. <laughs> they refused to meet for about three months, uh, and simply because the reason they weren't meeting is that uh, then Senator Kerry had refused a travel budget for, for another senator, and the senator promised that until his budget got approved, he would block every appointment. So for three months, they didn't meet. And then they, when they finally met, it was the last day of the Senate uh, session. And so they approved about 100 people in all of 60 seconds. And I was unanimously approved. Um, but thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, today. Uh, what we're going to talk about, and I'm, I come here uh, as a student, uh, much more than a, a moderator. What we're going to talk about is, I think, at the center uh, of Cuban history and, and Cuban sociology. In fact, if you, if you read the seminal book on, uh, on Cuban culture, uh, written by a fellow named Fernando Ortiz, uh, he titles it Cuban Counterpoint, Sugar and Tobacco. And that's because agriculture has been at the center of, of Cuban culture, Cuban history, uh, Cuban relations with the U.S. for its entire history. In fact, Columbus, when he first arrives in Cuba, uh, writes about being greeted by the Taino Indians smoking cigars, except he didn't really know what, the, what they were doing. Um, in the 1700s, sugar, tobacco, coffee, uh, become part of the Cuban culture. Uh, obviously, uh, they also support the institution of slavery. And, and, then, and that institution, uh, the peculiar institution, as it was called here in the US, uh, is intertwined with Cuban agriculture until the, uh, until the 1800s. And in fact, Cuba, other than Brazil, is the last country that abolishes slavery in 1878, in part because it was so intertwined with with the agriculture, with the economy of the, of the, of the region. Slavery and agriculture is also why, uh, if you look at Cuban history and Cuban relations with the US, uh, in the first half of the 19th century, there was a movement in the US to, uh, to annex Cuba. Cuba was going to be the next, uh, was going to be the next slave state uh, as part of the pre-Civil War uh, negotiations that were going on, and they would talk about how Cuba would was like a f ripe fruit that would fall from the tree, and that tree would be, uh, and that and the, and the U.S. would receive it. And, and part of that was because they saw the the potential 
of, of Cuban agriculture as well as the fact that it would provide a, uh, a slave state for, for the South. 1898 again, after the, the, what's called here the, uh, the Spanish-American War, um, uh, American investment becomes critical in, in Cuba, and then in fact the, the, the U.S. sugar companies uh, run a lot of, of the sugar production in Cuba. Uh, that leads to a, a, another peculiar institution which is called the Latifundios, very large uh, uh, privately owned uh, sugar mills and the like, which in 1959, and then uh, and I'll, I'll finish the, the history lesson, but that's important for, for what we're about to listen to now. In 1959, one of the first things that the Castro government does is to, uh, is to abolish private property in, uh, in, in agriculture and actually to nationalize all of the sugar mills. Uh, and that agrarian reform takes a little bit of a different form from what, um, from what you see in the rest of Latin America. If you look at agrarian reform in places like Bolivia, in places like, like Peru, they tend to privatize. They're the first privatizers. They privatize the agricultural land holdings. In Cuba, they don't do that. In Cuba, the state takes over the, 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 the production. And I think some of what Cheryl and, and Pedro will talk about uh, today is the effects of that and what that means for the production going forward. Um, so if you, if, you, if you had been in Cuba in the, uh, in, in the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, you would have seen very large, uh, almost Soviet-style, definitely Soviet-style types of land holdings with lots of, of machinery and lots of production. Not terribly efficient. Uh, but as you'll hear today, that production has, in fact, uh, reduced, been reduced. And, and what, you, what, you, uh, what we see today is a very inefficient uh, agricultural system and a, and a system that, and this gets us into uh, the current period, uh, that if Cuba is going to change, if Cuba is going to, uh, 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 if its history is, is going to change uh, following the, whatever happens to the Castro's agriculture will have to be at the center of it because 80% of, uh, of Cuba's food supply today is imported. Uh, there's lots of idle land, and again, in that context, uh, the U.S. will play a critical part. The U.S. will, uh, right now, after the, the liberalization of the embargo by, by President Obama last December, um, Cuban uh, U.S. agricultural exports can can go to can be sold in Cuba. And in fact, uh, until a couple of years ago, uh, the U.S. was the fourth or fifth largest exporter of food into Cuba, even with the embargo, because that was always liberalized. The liberalization that, that took place a few months ago hasn't changed that. In fact, uh, you, uh, you cannot have U.S. agriculture movement. That, that playing with dirt photograph, uh, I want to get on. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the liberalization of, of that took place last December really hasn't reached uh, U.S. agricultural companies that would very much like to invest in Cuba, but right now all that they can do is to, uh, is to sell agricultural products in Cuba. So that's the history. That's, uh, that's really the, the setup. Uh, and again, I think as you, as you, as you listen to uh, what, I, what I, uh, I think will be a fascinating discussion on the scientific and technical aspects of Cuban agriculture, remember the politics. And remember the history. Remember and think about how uh, the U.S. And, and the Cuban governments can work together to try and change a, a course of history that has gone on for too long. And I can't think of two better people to talk about this than Cheryl and Pedro. Um, uh, Pedro is a unique Cuban. I can say that as a Cuban. Uh, you know, Cuban, especially males, are brought up by their mothers to think they're geniuses. You know. Uh, <laughs> We uh, and uh, and Pe and I always introduce Pedro as the only certifiable <laughs> Cuban genius because of his MacArthur, MacArthur or whatever. Everybody else, you know, his parents and his dogs think they're great, but but they can't prove it. Pedro can. Uh, he also has, of course, something that I th I think is fascinating, and I'd love to hear about it someday when we're talking about African agriculture. Um, you know, to being a chief in both uh, Kenya, the Lua tribe, which by the way is President Obama's Absolutely. tribe. Uh, and, uh, and also the marathon runners. 
and uh, and obviously and from Nigeria and Cheryl, who has you know has a resume that, that and, a, and a research history that would make us all uh, uh, feel very minuscule. So with that, uh, let's 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 uh, hear about the the future of Cuban agriculture, and again, let's think about how this fits into the Cuban history. It's a history of monoculture history of latifundios, a history where Cubans and, and agriculture, uh, for many years, Cubans have thought of agriculture as something the poor people did, that uneducated uh, people did. And how that fits into a pattern where they're gonna, Cubans will have to feed themselves is something that I'd love to hear about uh, today. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, <clears throat> Jose. I like to add on this culture thing that uh, Cuban and American psyches are very, actually very close. Uh, baseball is, is a, be, a main unifying factor. And since I was a kid, I was rooting for the New York Yankees. And I'm still a Yankee fan because they used to train in Cuba during the, uh, during the winter time. So, um, so it's there. Also, uh, the war revolution of Cuba against Spain was hatched in Tampa, Florida. And um, that's when Miami was still a swamp. So there's a long, long set of relationships in both. But as Jose said, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, possibilities of food security. And, uh, and starting with the fact that Cuba is currently importing 80% of its food at a cost of two billion US dollars a year or 3% of the GDP. That's a very high percentage of, of the GDP to be importing food. At the same time, first paradox is you have that, but about half to one million hectares or one to 2.5 million acres of prime agricultural land is unused. And, uh, and that is, uh, that I think it's a great opportunity. The total agricultural cropland area of Cuba is about 1.5 million hectares. So this is, this is pretty close to it. Great opportunity. Some private farmers are very successful. Uh, some of them, I'm told, are, are millionaire, millionaires in, in dollar terms because they're able to produce uh, a lot of crops there. And, uh, and on the other hand, there's very little interesting farming by uh, by the high school graduates uh, because in true Soviet fashion, uh, many, many years ago, the rural areas were cleared out of people and everybody was resettled in towns or cities. This was seen in Tanzania a lot and happened the same in Cuba. So there's been a, a, a real disconnect uh, between, uh, especially between the youth and agriculture. We need to make agriculture attractive, sexy, and, and, uh, and good business. Also, Cuban scientists are very poorly paid. My colleagues there with similar levels of training are earning about 40 US dollars a month. That's a, that's a problem. Where I'm coming from, well, my, my father had a lot of uh, great influence on me. And uh, he's an, he was an agronomist and, and uh, he had a business of, uh, of a Chilean nitrate fertilizers and, and that took me because I wanted to travel with him all over the island. And uh, as a little toddler, I was already playing with dirt. And I keep playing with dirt. And I must say, I'm very well paid to be <laughs> playing with dirt. But that's, that's, sort of the, uh, uh, that's sort of the background. I left Cuba after finishing high school to uh, go to university, to go to Cornell University here. Uh, we had a farm there in, uh, in uh, Caimito, what is called now Artemisa province. Uh, 54 hectares, or about 110, 120 acres. Uh, very good soils, Matanzas clay. That was our farmhouse. That was my dad on the side. Uh, he was exporting avocados uh, monthly to the United States as Sanchez brand. And um, I'm also, uh, what I see over there with a, with a, with a grain legume with a legume ground cover is what we call now agroforestry. I had no idea uh, about that then. Uh, but he was able to, to get different varieties so they would uh, pr produce fruits uh, every month. We also grew three crops of potatoes a year, not on, the same, not on the same piece of land, but different pieces of land. 
and they were exported to Venezuela for some odd reason. And the winter in, in Cuba is a little cold. No, it doesn't freeze or anything like, but temperatures drop. And then you can grow uh, winter vegetables like, uh, like cabbages or broccoli and stuff like that under irrigator. That's my baby brother, uh, 11 years younger uh, than me, of course. He's considerably older now. So one of the things we try to do this time is to figure out whether we could locate the farm. So I Google Earth it the best I could, but boy, things had changed a lot. Roads and this and that. I wasn't really sure. Uh, so the day after we arrived, Cheryl and I arrived, um, our, our friends from the Soil Science Institute uh, already not only had Google Earth it, but also using GPS and so on in what we thought was a farm. And I was totally disconcerted. I couldn't really see anything until I remember that we had a big well, and one of the old-fashioned wells surrounded by, by stones, not a tube well. So I said, hey, has anybody seen a well around here? I said, oh, yeah, 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 here, 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 coming in. There it was. So, so yeah. It, this is part of now the half to, uh, half to one million hectares of abandoned high-quality farmland. As you see, not much is growing there. Thank goodness there's a cover. Uh, there's a cover of guinea grass and some, uh, and some fruit trees, so the land is not really being compacted or, or, or uh, uh, degenerated. Uh, but one of the things I saw was so pleased to see this as when my father was doing. He introduces uh, mango, uh, it was called super heighten in English, but it's super high. And uh, he introduced it on our farm and uh, produces enormous mangoes, like about this much. And one mango can feed a family. And you can see the little tree that needs buttresses and, and so on. So I was very glad to see that still going. When we came there last May, our first official day was in the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, where we talk about ideas that we have and listen to, to their plans and, uh, and basically uh, started the conversation. The lady in the center is a lady of research, the, the head of research for the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, the one to the, to the left of her is a uh, former ambassador to North Korea. That must have been a drag. But, but anyway, <laughs> but each ministry has its uh, diplomatic advisors to it. And the other ones are our uh, colleagues, or the other one. Anyway, uh, Havana has improved tremendously since I was there 20 years ago during this so-called special period. And, and, and this basically encapsulates that. The buildings are being rebuilt. Um, and the cars, the old 1950 cars, are being rebuilt too, painted with diesel engines on them, and, uh, and in, in beautiful shape. Before, they used to be the old, you know, incredible uh, junk piles. Going to Malecon, the main, uh, the sea, sea wall of, of Havana, uh, you see things uh, going very, very well. There are many tourists here, but they're mostly Cubans and the Morro Castle in the back, which is legendary from Spanish day. The University of Havana is actually the second oldest university in this hemisphere, older than Columbia, but just younger than Harvard. And guess what? It has an alma mater just like the one we have over there. And uh, I made a little research on that and found out and, you know, who copied who. Well, the Cubans copied Columbia University. That's what happened. A bunch of Cuban arch uh, architects came here at, uh, towards the end of the 1800s and uh, saw Alma Mater there and decided to copy it. And so there she is in Cuba, but the Cuban Alma Mater is a bit more tropical. Uh, she is bare-breasted, and the lady who posed for this was the grandmother of one of my classmates. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot of connection there anyway. But perhaps the most, the most important thing is, is the connection I and the friendship I built with Cuban scientists uh, throughout my visits back there in 1975, in 1985, in 1994, and, and, and seeing them in all sorts of international conferences and so on. Among them is Dr. Olegario Muñiz, who was in the same high school I was, he stayed in Cuba. Uh, he ha he's an excellent soil chemist. Uh, 
and uh, president of the Cuban Society of Soil Science, and there he was introducing me, a big talk I had to give in, uh, in this meeting that we, Cheryl and I went in. Uh, here's a talk, I'm down there saying something and talking about Africa and the fact that Africans have cell phones all over the place. Cuba has, has very limited cell phone coverage, incredibly, uh, incre incredibly obsolete. And uh, it's, it's really difficult not to be around with, uh, with internet communications for a while. But uh, hopefully <clears throat> that, is, uh, uh, that is getting a bit better now. Some of my other friends, Alberto Hernandez, he is uh, he's a couple of years older than I am, and uh, he is a top uh, soil uh, taxonomist in Cuba, international standing. We were in a, in a soil pit there, and somebody said, boy, that's about 150 years of soil expertise between the two of us. Um, but good friends. And then another one is Rafael Villegas to my left, um, who uh, is actually my counterpart now. He is uh, a top scientist, a member of the Cuban Academy of Sciences, and has very good political nose. So um, he and I are, are trying to make this idea happen. But one night we were just out of uh, La Bodeguita del Medio, a very famous uh, uh, restaurant, and afterwards, carrying the, uh, the extra food, uh, this guy who was driving this sort of bicycle taxi uh, came to me and says, well, you know, I wanna, I'm fed up here, I wanna go to the United States, blah, 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 very loudly, and blah, 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 very loudly also, because of a few mojitos, I, um, I started telling him, hey, don't, you, don't think that everything is hunky-dory in the United States, there are you know, a lot of issues and all that. And Cheryl was getting very upset because both of us were talking rather loudly. And that there was a police, policeman here, and you see the, the, uh, the, um, the wheel of his motorcycle. So she was saying, watch out, you know, there's a policeman here and all that. And we kept going, 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 going. And finally, it was a time for us to look for a taxi and we're trying to figure it out. The policeman came and says, I'll get you a taxi with my cell phone. <laughs> so that would have been absolutely impossible 20 years ago or any of this other time. We would have both been put in jail and, and, and never, never seen of each other again. It's, it's this opening now that, that is, is just transformational. And I think it's, it's, it's not, it's, uh, you cannot stop it anymore. It has happened and uh, people are excited. Oh, this is since the Obama-Castro um, joint, joint statement of almost a year ago. Uh, people are very excited about it. Um, you have American flags all over the place or in, in your, in your t-shirts and all that. Nobody cares before anybody would go to jail quickly if that didn't happen. So there's been, there's been, there's been a real significant change. So now get me focus a bit more on the technical side. Cuba has excellent geography and infrastructure for agriculture. The total area, about 11.1 million hectares or 28 million acres, is the same size as the state of Virginia in the US, which is sort of a, an average size state in this country. The length, about 750 miles, is the same if you drive from Miami to Atlanta. So it's rather long. Um, it's a narrow island, average width, about 60 miles. And of course, it has proximity to major markets. It has a stable population of 11 million, and it's an educated population. And this is amazing, because it, it was 11 million when I left Cuba. And along with me, there were a, a, about 2 million Cubans who left at that time. And the population has grown now in the last 50 years and has absolutely stabilized at 11 million. Some people are saying it's actually 10 point something now. Other countries, by that time, they would have tripled uh, their population. Certainly, that's what we've seen in Africa. And this is an educated population because the uh, uh, schooling is very, very good. And so is public health. Biophysically, it's mostly, it's a piece of mostly flat land to undulating, but mainly very flat, uplifted limestone from, from the ocean, which makes the soils very fertile. And you have three mountain ranges in between. They're rather small. And uh, in my opinion, it is the best rainfall regime of the tropics. It's called the subhumid tropics, where you have a six-month rainy season. 
and a six-month dry season to me that is the optimum of, of, uh, of different uh, rainfall regimes that you could have. And it's very much like the rainfall regime, like the Brazilian Cerrado, this, this uh, 200 million hectare miracle that has happened in Brazil in the last 30 years, exporting food all over the place. Uh, but the Cerrado has acid soils that they learn to manage it very well. But Cuba, no. Cuba has very fertile soils because of this limestone. So I never thought much about it, but when I started thinking about it, uh, Cuba is probably the most fertile of any tropical country. The second may be Costa Rica because of its volcanic soils. And it has three main soils, and I won't bore you with the details, but, but each one is, is quite good, quite fertile, and has very few infertile soils. So um, that's, that's a tremendous asset to have that soil, which are not really seriously degraded, to have, uh, to have the, uh, the six months wet, six months dry season, and to have the geographical proximity to the United States. They're, both, they're all incredible assets. So I could summarize the stages of Cuban agriculture in, into four. And pre-1959, pre the Castro Revolution, as Jose said, there were large sugarcane latifundios, um, most of them foreign owned, and at the same time, much rural poverty. Really, there was, there was a lot of poor people in, in the rural areas. Uh, as an indicator, the national sugarcane production, sugar, not sugarcane, sugar production, was six to seven million tons a year. At that time, when I was roaming around the countryside with my father, sugarcane was about as tall as this, as tall as this ceiling, and dark green, meaning that it has a lot of fertility. Then, from 60 to uh, 1960 to 1989, it was a Soviet model, large state farms, as, as Jose said, they confiscated everything, uh, large state farm, but with excessive use of fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation, heavy machinery. Some of the machineries that I saw when I was there in 75, it seemed something out of a Terminator movie. You know, it's a sort of monster things on rails and so on, extremely heavy, extremely compacting. And at that time, I saw the sugar cane maybe about this high and getting yellow. And getting yellow means it was nitrogen deficiency. Then comes 1990 to 2005, what is called euphemistically the special period, which started with the sudden end of the Eastern Bloc subsidy. Suddenly, boom, like that. Uh, it was, it was uh, very drastic and, and very, 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 very hard time for any country to, uh, to adjust to that. Uh, they shifted to organic farming in urban areas. Uh, as you'll see later, not enough to, to, uh, to get to food security, but, but something, they did their best they could. And then things began to get better in 2005 to the present. There's a gradual shift towards a market-based economy. Um, sugar production <laughs> now is about two to three million tons instead of six to seven. And uh, Cuba, you see, during the, 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 the sugar you see during the rainy season is now about yay high and absolutely yellow. So um, it, gives you, it gives you an idea. But what, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a set of ups and downs there. Uh, a lot can be learned from this history of, of a half a century here or a century's history of really unique changes and drastic changes. And the ability of the Cubans to accommodate to that is, has been amazing. So for example, this is sugar cane. Uh, not sugar, sugar cane and sugar, different. Um, but the point I wanted to make here is in the, in the area harvested, you see this drop since about 1997 of about a million hectares. This was intentional. Uh, this is when uh, Castro decided to close about half of the sugar mills because they were ancients. They were centuries old. They were very inefficient. So he, he made this major, uh, major changes. And of course, the production dropped like crazy. This is not in tons of million tons of sugar, but in tons of uh, sugar cane. But anyway, you see, you, see the, you see the changes there. And a lot of this idle land is a product of that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through, uh, uh, through this table, which uh, 
which I, I try to, uh, uh, okay. So we'll look at the yields of major crops in sugar in Cuba, in sub-Saharan Africa, and in the world. And the yields, crop yields are the most important indicator. The first is, is, not, is not the only one, but it, it gives you an idea. Uh, the sugarcane yields during this about the same period were inferior to those of Africa and certainly to those of the world. Uh, another major uh, uh, crop, plantains, uh, cooking bananas, and pretty much several of the other root and tuber crops like malanga, taro, yame, yams, cassava, sweet potatoes, and potatoes. Most of them were above or, or nearby the, uh, um, let's say, the world average or the national average. Cassava, which is very important, is much lower, uh, but more or less like that. Then corn, about exactly like the, the uh, African average, which is very bad, but certainly way below the the uh, world average, and, uh, and potatoes, very well in potatoes, beans, very good, fantastic uh, production of beans, uh, but unfortunately there is not enough acreage of it. And, and even tobacco and coffee, some two very, very uh, distinctive exports uh, are, are below the, the African or the world average. So for example, beans, and these are basically black beans. The, the staple food of Cuba is rice and beans, basically. And, and, and you see that there's been a, a very important in increase in yields in the last few years. Uh, that's, that's very laudable. Um, the area harvested uh, also increased, and, uh, and production also increased in the last few years. And I want you to remember this data here at about 130,000 tons of beans. But one thing that my colleagues, when I presented this slide, did not put together is production and importation. This 80% of the, of the food that it's, that it's uh, imported. So I put this together using, using their data from FAO and uh, ONE, the Oficina Nacional de Estadística, the National Statistics Office, and just put them together. Um, wheat is 100% imported, and that, up to now, it's the way it has to be, because wheat is a temperate region crop and doesn't tolerate high temperatures. Up to now, there's a change coming on that, but up to now, that makes perfect sense. But 68% of the corn, 72% of the beans, even though the yields were high, about half the rice and about one third of the fresh milk and one third of the beef and 80% of, uh, of the poultry was imported. Uh, this, this is the stuff that has been imported and, and it's just for, for, uh, for a tropical country to import this, more, this much corn or beans or rice and certainly poultry and fresh milk um, is, is uh, it's not a good thing. Uh, I was asked uh, by, by a senator, well, how about agriculture imports from the US? So I looked it up. The bottom line is, as of uh, 2012, 2011, it was only 18% of the imports uh, came from the United States. And most of them soybeans and poultry meat and corn and animal feed. Wheat, they must be getting it from Canada, and, and so on. But anyway, the, uh, they're still, because the law, uh, the law permitted uh, importation, and, and there's, that's good. Now, urban organic agriculture is very interesting, because um, for me, uh, with more of, a, of an African inclination now, I'm totally opposed to organic farming there, because the soils are depleted of nutrients. And that means that you cannot grow even the organic things. But what I saw here with very fertile soils, very different, uh, and, uh, and a lot of labor, um, and, and including, including uh, uh, having, a, having a, a ceiling protecting against insects and so on, very high input, 
organic agriculture has been, I think, very nice in, in the urban areas. This is another uh, urban area next to what used to be the country club of Havana, next to where Castro lives in, the, in this area. So all of a sudden you, you have this thing. And, and uh, this is all very nice, but the problem is that what is being produced are mainly vegetables and condiments. And that doesn't fill anybody's belly. So it's not tackling the fundamental things of producing corn, rice, uh, beans, and so on. Although beans could, could, be, could grow in, in a situation like this very well. So there's a lot of hype about organic agriculture. Um, I got some data, and uh, the total amount is something like 3,000 to 9,000 hectares, depending who's counting. But it's only 0 2 or 0 6% of the harvested area. So it's still too small to take care of things. But it's, it's, it's good, and, and they do it very professionally, and they have no qualms about organic agriculture if you're starting from fertile soils like, like, like they have. The question is, can it, be, can it be extrapolated to most? So in summary, mm -hmm. I would say focus first on increasing food production and make it available for all Cubans all the time. And with the current 80% uh, importation, there are delays, there are snafus, there are logistic snafus, and sometimes there are very serious uh, food shor shortages in specific areas. Need a real national food security program. That's one of the things we'll be talking with him uh, when Cheryl and I go there next week, uh, a week from Friday. Um, and uh, with the fact that more than 50% of the rice, maize, beans, and poultry meat, and one third of the milk and beef is imported, these are the things that you should focus on. There is no problem with what we call the viandas, the root and tuber crops, like cassava, and, and yams, and, and potatoes. They are all doing very, very well. So this half a, half a million to one million hectares certainly can be put uh, can be put into cultivation. Uh, this is extensification in terms of expanding the area under crops, but most of the extensification in other countries comes at the price of deforesting, deforestation of new areas. In this case, it's, it's, all, it's all there, totally agricultural, with good infrastructure about it, rural electrification and so on. So certainly it's doing no, no ecological damage to extensify there. And, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very, very positive. It's, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity. There is a weed called marabou that came from, uh, from Africa somehow. And, and it's, uh, it's an invasive species and can be a major, a major problem. It really takes over places. And this is, this is the way it looks. So, but where there's, a, where there's a problem, there is a solution. And the solution that I heard about there, I haven't seen any data on this, but is that uh, some companies are exporting the charcoal from Marabou as a very high quality charcoal for barbecues. And uh, well, you can imagine if you get a high quality charcoal like this available in the American market, there might be, might be a lot of takers. And you put a good Cuban brand and good, good brand development and marketing, it could be. And at the same time, uh, get rid of this gradually. But it's a, it's a major problem, but I think this one has a solution. Other conclusions now going into sustainable intensification. That means increasing yields per hectare uh, without messing up the environment. And, and uh, so I think for sure, even on, even on existing land, it can be done to reach at least a world average yields with improved varieties, hybrids, or GMOs. They have no policy on agricultural GMOs, but they use a lot of GMOs in their medical biotechnology industry. So I hope they learn from that and not get into any of the hang-ups that some countries have against GMOs. And you need higher mineral, organic fertilization, better agronomy, and better agriculture. Another thing that is really lacking is a modern seed systems. Where do you go and buy systems, uh, seeds in Cuba? Where do you go there? Well, right now you go to a central place 
and, and it's, uh, it's uh, as I understand it, in very bad shape. It hasn't changed uh, very much. Uh, they have, uh, <clears throat> they, they are not using modern germplasm from the CGIR centers, or let's say from Embrapa in Brazil, and, and places like that. And that is, if there's going to be a sustainable agriculture, you cannot do it without an effective seed production system. Uh, and they should produce, uh, it should be done in a way that you have higher yields with less water, less fertilizer, and less greenhouse gas emission. Climate change is a real, is already a big issue there because it's getting more and more droughts. And, of, and sea water, sea level rise. So, um, so both the sea level rise and the increasing in droughts is, is going to make things uh, different. In terms of agriculture, the main thing for droughts is to, is to have more drought tolerant varieties or, or varieties that, are, uh, that harvest in a shorter period of time so you can avoid some of the droughts. A major new crop could be soybeans. That for, I don't know what reason, they, they don't grow much soybean. Actually, there's no data on how much soybean is grown. And it's good for uh, direct consumption, 35% protein. It's excellent for animal feed. Like, like pork and chickens and monogastrics like us. Uh, and so you, you don't normally, in countries like this, during the rainy season, what you see is corn, soybeans, just like we do here in the Midwest. But you go to Brazil, that's what you see. And you don't see corn either, or maize. It's been an unintentionally neglected crop. Uh, and I don't know why. I don't know where this came from, but we ate tamales and all sorts of things coming out of corn. So it's not that corn is not known, uh, but as for some reason it's not there. Um, there's new technology that can create I, I, you know, uh, <clears throat> internet technology based on uh, base jobs to help agriculture. We're talking about the soil dog system for in situ soil analysis that we're developing and, and testing in Africa. But it has, a, has an Android tablet. So for those people, and I don't think there are enough in Cuba yet, who are really hooked up to their, to their machines because of the poor internet connections. Uh, but this, this would make people who have that ability, young people, to, to, to work in agriculture. This is what we're trying in Africa. I, I, I think this internet block has to, uh, it's really a major obstacle to all the things that we're talking about here. Uh, during the special period, uh, desperate for, for trying to get nutrients other than fertilizers because they couldn't import fertilizers, Cuban scientists developed a bunch of biofertilizers that are very, very interesting. The mycorrhiza uh, uh, fungi um, that you can apply. Um, actually, I've seen some of the best data on mycorrhiza uh, in Cuba, which are some actual evidence that it really works in in the field. But now they have uh, inoculations of uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, uh, something called phosphorina, which is uh, uh, another bacteria uh, that is added to, uh, to rock phosphate to dissolve it, etc. I haven't seen any scientific evidence of those two, and uh, I I'm, I'm just want to make sure that, they're, that, that what they say is really, it's really valid. But in the case of mycorrhiza, I'm uh, I'm convinced. Uh, have a legume, just, just good agronomy. Have a legume in every any, uh, rotation, improve organic agriculture, and rural conventional agriculture. Both systems can coexist and help each other. Pastures with tropical legumes can be used to grow more milk and beef without resorting to field lots. And then if that's the case, grass-fed beef can be a new export of Cuba. As more people here in this country are getting uh, want to have grass-fed beef, which is certainly better for your health than feedlot-based beef. And as, and as the world gets richer, it will demand more high-quality niche products. Uh, Cuba, uh, the name Cuba already is a great brand, and, uh, and uh, many of these pro uh, products like the super high mango and, and the marabou charcoal, all this stuff uh, could, could, uh, uh, could produce if, if well-marketed. And again, we need a new generation of young, internet-savvy farmers. Now, I think this is, 
No. I, I, there, there are a bunch of research issues that are cropping, and uh, based on what I've been able to travel around, including a trip last week to Senegal, uh, for rice, which is, which is a real bad problem because there's been uh, seawater in, intrusion into the rice paddies in, in the southern parts of Cuba, and that just is wiping out rice production. They did the, do those paddies without a drainage system, which is a tremendous error, and, uh, and therefore everything is stuck. But there are salinity tolerant varieties for lowland areas coming especially out of the Philippines, and I've been fascinated by listening to the high-yielding Brazilian upland rice varieties, uh, varieties that you grow just like you grow any other crop, and uh, yield very well in the state of Mato Grosso, good grain quality. It has to be tested for diseases, but that's something that I think we can learn from, from our Brazilian friends. On, on beans, uh, we have to see all these different germplasm centers and only for beans that are black. They have a black seed coat, and when they cook, they're cooked, they're still black. That's what we like. But I've seen climbing beans in, in the eastern Congo. Uh, instead of having a little bean plant here, what you have is you put a stick and, and, you, and you increase your yield uh, tremendously. And, and, and that could be done. And as I mentioned before, tri beans in these urban organic farms, uh, because the screen protectors and all that would help with insects. Cassava, there's a lot of cassavas doing very well, but they should be processed into starch, and there are actually some high vitamin A cassava now. And the most interesting of all these crazy ideas is wheat. ICARDA, the International Center for Research in Arid Areas, based in Aleppo, Syria, and of course they had to get out of there, but they're working every place they can. They told me, uh, a friend of mine told me last week in Dakar, he says, we're really getting uh, good, good results with tropical wheat wheat tolerant to high temperatures and very high yielding. And well, that's something to try because nobody's gonna stop Cubans from, from eating bread. Cuban bread is in itself a brand. And, and the same thing with other tropical countries. They, wheat is one of the things you really have to import. So this could be, this could be very exciting. So, our, uh, Grass legume pastures, yeah. Artisanal fishing in non-protected area. Cuba has some beautifully protected areas off, uh, off the coast uh, that must be kept at all cost. But when Cheryl and I went there, and in the hotel we were there, we asked for fish. So we got some fish. We asked the waiter, what's this fish? I says, oh, it's an Asian fish that we import a lot of. And what's it called? Mahi Mahi. And I said, doggone it, that's called Dorado in Cuba, and I used to fish him a lot. There's a tremendous amount of those. Why should we import this stuff from Thailand or something? So there are other technologies. But anyway, let me, let me, let me just say that right now we just have to, there's quite a bit of enthusiasm in Cuba about let's doing something, and of course, we'll go slowly, slowly. But basically, that, the message uh, that I want to give you is that uh, Things can be done in what they consider the number one priority, which is food security. And so far, so good. Thanks. Okay, I'll just uh, be spending a few minutes so we can have a discussion. And I don't have nice pictures like Pedro did, so I'm glad he pulled out some pictures. But I just wanna bring up four points. Um, that I think are really important as people think forward. The very first one is this whole participation and planning, and you alluded to it. We have to keep in mind what's happened over the last 100, 200 years, and particularly the last 50 years. There is interest in real dialogue with U.S. scientists um, about agriculture, about food security, about organic agriculture or other kinds. So there real opportunities for research, and then higher level discussions also. One key thing is that the research scientists, graduate students we talk to in Cuba, they're afraid of English. It wasn't encouraged, so very few really speak English. They'll read it, technically, 
they're afraid to write, and so there are very few scientific publications, and I think that's a real opportunity to think how to have partnerships between students to really help learn English and not be afraid of it in writing. So I'll just bring up a few ideas about how research and exchange of students and ideas could, could be really exciting. And I think that is one that is desperately needed for them to move forward with their research. The other one I want to talk about is the organic agriculture. And there are lots of books and great things. And you'll talk to people, well, uh, Cuba's feeding themselves organically. And you read it in headlines and stuff like that. But if you look at the numbers that Pedro put up there, it's not the case. And that's not to mean it's not working. It is working. And I think they have, out of necessity, developed some really, really interesting and unique, I would call it biological agriculture. Um, it's organic, but it's also just biological that could be used even with fertilizers, a lot of these techniques. And I think the challenge is how to intensify, as Pedro said, and extensify for more food production. There needs to be some way to see how the two can be meshed and work together. Um, I don't think anything could ever be all organic and feed Cuba, or, or the world is a lot of... Uh, papers document now, but we certainly don't want to go back to the days when Russia was dumping a lot of inappropriate fertilizers and too much. And so how do you get agricultural intensification without just going to the too much fertilizer? And I think the Cuban scientists are very excited about how to use what they've developed to scale it up, but also to think how it can be linked with increasing fertilizer use, and they recognize that's critical. So I think there are lots of exciting research opportunities um, in that sense. I'm going to challenge Pedro a little bit in the whole thing about increasing yields of many of those crops, in, including corn. I would like to suggest that maybe having Cuba not focus so much on increasing staple crop productions would ha usually have low prices that are always decreasing. All right, that's what happened with staple crops. And so is that the way to get to food security? Or can they really focus on many of these more diversified crops and diversified cropping systems, agroforestry in particular, where you bring in tree crops, which are the native habit, habitat of Cuba, our trees, all right? And so how do you use tree crops combined with them um, row crops and things like that. There's all sorts of ways to do it, and I think Cuba could be a perfect example of how to move forward as they think about intensifying agriculture. You pr produce um, tree um, products that are much more valuable per unit than is maize, than is rice, and they have high value, high export value. So I think this is part of the participatory planning. I think economists, both microeconomists and macroeconomists and uh, policy economists, really need to work with Cuban colleagues to really analyze this before people just go out uh, and looking at the staple crops. I think it's a real interesting thing. And I, then I might, my last point is people have talked about conservation and sustainable development or sustainable agriculture since I was a student. Um, and you never really see very good examples. Um, one wins and one loses usually. And I think this is a really unique opportunity to see how these forests, there's a fantastic um, project with the Nature Conservancy. They've been working in Cuba for the last 20 years helping protect reefs, marine resources, forests. So Cuba, for the Caribbean, has the highest area of protected marine areas, forests, rivers, watersheds, and things like that. So as Pedro said, how can that be maintained at the same time you increase agricultural production? And I think there are some exciting ways to think think that through. And it is a real opportunity for sustainable development, where people have the education. We're working in Africa, and there's not the human capacity. There's certainly the human capacity in Cuba to think through these issues and think of a way forward where you can have conservation and sustainable agriculture at the same time. So those are my challenges, and I look forward to questions. I believe we're supposed to sit over here for a few minutes. So, so it, it's interesting, Cheryl, because you know, in five minutes, you packed a lot of uh, 
<laughs> a, a, a lot of questions there that I think that some of which are much better articulated than I would have been. But when I was in, in at the State Department, one of the things that we talked about a lot was food security. Not so much, obviously not with Cuba, but with Africa. And and the question that you brought up, which was, do countries feed themselves by growing stable crops, or do they, or do you encourage trade so that you you uh, you grow what you are best at and what might yield the highest price, and you import the rest. And it, it does bring a little bit of insecurity in the sense that you know somebody could have a, a food embargo or a crop embargo, like Argentina may have done you know, a, few, um, with, uh, a few years ago, and you have a problem. But how, tell us a little bit about how that thinking is going in Cuba in terms of the import substitution debate versus the grow the highest priced crops that can, that it's a capitalist notion that you will have to trade <laughs> as opposed to sort of being self-sufficient. How is that debate going on? Well, we actually, when we were meeting with the Ministry of Agriculture, they were talking a lot about production for food security. Um, in, even when it came to poultry and things like that, because mm -hmm. there are I don't, Pedro probably has the numbers right, but they, they're importing a lot. And even mm -hmm. eggs, they're not producing enough eggs and things like that. So I don't think it's all one or the other, mm -hmm. but they're certainly thinking about the amount of money they're spending now mm -hmm. to bring in food. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where I said you need um, policy experts, mm -hmm. macroeconomists, mm -hmm. trade people to really think that through. Again, I don't think it should be all or none because you do have these problems. If there's a bad year, if uh, there is an embargo, if the price of oil goes way up and the price of maize and rice just skyrockets again. Mm -hmm. But I think a thorough analysis before would be useful. And I think they're, they're really thinking about that thing. But, but the tropical fruits, I don't know about exports, Pedro, if you looked into that. But I mean, I was in a market just recently and there were small mangoes, and I just happened to say, oh, we should get some big Cuban mangoes, and it became a huge discussion mm -hmm. with all the people around the mangoes in some stop and shop. So they were very interested. Oh, when, when can we buy Cuban mangoes? So mm -hmm. they're already thinking yeah. about yeah. it. So. Well, I, I think, Jose, one, one thing that we felt lacking in the, in the different meetings and the different um, visits uh, to fields that we did is e economists. Yeah. They're not around. They're not around. They, they, uh, they, it seems to be a totally separate discipline, and economics and agriculture is, is absolutely essential. So, so uh, I, I think they've been just trying to grow more and more and more without looking at things like prices and markets and so on. And on the other hand, they're excellent academic economists at the University of Havana and so on, but they don't have real contact. Uh, with uh, <clears throat> uh, with what's going on with the farmers, so I, I think part of part of the, the the thing we would like to promote there is is the inclusion of of agricultural economists, macroeconomists as well beyond agriculture, into all these food security issues. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a unique situation. I haven't seen any other country that you just the economists are just not around. Right. And, and something you didn't talk about in, in, in your work in Africa, that's critical as well, which is uh, the constraint to growth that infrastructure places. I mean, t things such as cold storage facilities, uh, transportation. Talk a little bit about how the thinking there and what, 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 you've, what you've seen in terms of the needs for infrastructure in, in the Cuban agriculture. Yeah. Uh, I think already Cuba is in much better shape than most of African countries. Um, certainly when I was growing up, uh, the railroads and, and the road infrastructures were there. Uh, we understand that the main highway now uh, is, is, doesn't extend all the way, the real big superhighway doesn't extend all the way to the, to the end of the eastern provinces. So there's, I'm sure it's worth to go. And uh, tell you more about we, uh, we have this uh, <clears throat> trip plan that our colleagues are planning, which will 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 just go all over Cuba. So um, and and uh, they have to do a job there because you need special permission and and so on in the government. Um, well, I'll tell you more about it. But what I've seen near Havana 
is very good infrastructure, mm -hmm. very good infrastructure. And the new roads are well planned. Um, uh, the fact that they're getting the port of Havana out of the city of Havana. Uh, Havana has been primarily a port. It has a very nice, uh, <clears throat> very, very, very nice bay protected and, and so on. That's, that's when the pirates were around, you needed to do that. But uh, so they're transferring all that now to a similar harbor in Mariel uh, nearby. And, and uh, railroads uh, getting out of Mariel into other areas. I think this, there's a lot of Brazilian aid into this one. Mm -hmm. And it will be very nice to get all this port uh, things come uh, out of Havana and, and, and put it someplace else. Because uh, this is where you attract a lot of pollution and you attract all sorts of things. And Havana uh, is, is, is really a very special, uh, beautiful city. So the infrastructure that is terrible is the internet infrastructure. And, uh, and, and I, I keep telling them, listen, if you're, if you're afraid, I mean politically afraid, because you have the internet, you've got to create all sorts of things, look at the Chinese. The Chinese have some of the best internet I've seen around, perfectly available. But they do put some nasty controls there if you don't want this or other ones. Well, do the same thing. I don't think you want to encourage that. <laughs> well, I cannot say that in front of them. But, uh, but, but what have you found in terms of spoilage, going back to the, is in the, for example, in a place like India, 50% of the produce doesn't make it from the farm to the market. Do you have that in, in Cuba? We didn't see anything like that. Yeah. yeah th so the other thing I'd just like to add is uh, electricity. Mm -hmm. which yeah. is essential for uh, yeah. cold storage, all sorts of things. Um, it's all over. So rural electrification was very, very successful. Mm -hmm. The problem is now that the cost of electricity, of energy in Cuba is just so high, mm -hmm. people aren't using it. Because mm -hmm. I said, oh, it's dark, people don't have lights. They said, no, they have them, they just can't afford to pay for them. Mm -hmm. And you don't see tractors anywhere. You don't see mechanization. It's all hand labor. And so until there's some way to bring down the price of energy, agricultural intensification will be extremely difficult. It's amazingly labor intensive right now. We saw horse and buggies everywhere mm -hmm. out in the, the rural areas. So even though the infrastructure is there, it's mm -hmm. not currently used because of economics and yeah. finances. Yeah. There, and there's an answer to, I mean, there's a possible solution to that is forget about growing sugar cane for sugar and grow it for ethanol mm -hmm. yeah. and get and get your and get your um, <clears throat> your fuel from that as Brazil did 20 30 years ago so former president of Brazil Lula came to Cuba and to try to sell that idea to Fidel Castro and Fidel Castro said absolutely not he said it very clearly I will not change food into energy, because we need food, and, and sugar, of course, is food. So I don't think any of that's going to happen until Fidel Castro dies, because this is one of the things that well, they already told me, don't you dare mention anything about this, even though it's a fine idea, but it's, it's not going to fly because of this. But the uh, dependency now is on, on petroleum from Venezuela, a subsidized term. How long is that going to last? Probably not long because Venezuela's uh, <coughs> economy is sinking uh, very rapidly. So maybe there. Uh, well, of course, you, you will have. You should have more development on, so, on solar power. Uh, certainly, Cuba is a sunny place, and, uh, and in some cases, in some areas, it's a windy place. So we can begin to use some of these uh, this, uh, uh, sources of, sources of energy. But I, I, I see I see a big problem. Uh, coming um, with, especially when Venezuela um, says, sorry, we cannot do anymore. One last question, yeah, and then, we we'll, open then we'll open it up, um, for me anyway. Um, economics, knowledge, infrastructure, research, all that takes investment. It's either going to come from the state or it's going to come from the private sector. Uh, given your experience, in, in Africa, um, where if you were putting together a, you, 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 there's two tracks here. One is the, the, the technical scientific track, and you've got that covered pretty well. 
but but how do you put how do you put the plan together for a for the type of investment that you're going to need in order to 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 make the technology work what what are you seeing what is what the dialogue in cuba is it about getting the private sector involved getting the ugly american companies in there uh, the franken foods uh, uh, you know how do you what, what 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 what's the discussion like in cuba on private sector versus state led development in agriculture we didn't hear much about that issue but we were there a very very short time uh -huh. tell you more about it when we come back yeah, okay. maybe gabriel here could help us because he's got a lot of experience but let's let's africa is now at a takeoff stage mm -hmm. and part of the reason it is is that the private sector got in uh, both the international private sector and then recognition of the local private sector dealers that and the guy running a little bodega is a private sector person and so on. And to the point now that Africa's banks have huge liquidity. <coughs> and the best, uh, and a lot of very rapid development is going on in Africa now. And infrastructure and, and yields are increasing and, and, and everything else. Um, I, I think all that is, is, is due to, largely to the private sector. Uh, the private sector in Africa, for example, now the banks are beginning to lend money for people who have no collateral, smallholder farmers, because they've had some credit guarantees, and then after that, yeah, the default, the default of these people, these poor people who have no, no collateral, the default rate is very small, similar to, to, the, to the normal one. Uh, Cuba, I think the idea of banks like that, <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. Uh, private sector, they probably have an allergy and they will talk about Monsanto and, and, and all these things. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot, not there yet. I mean, and this, is, this is very early before we get in, in, into these issues, I feel. Yeah, just one quick thing and then, um, so when we were there, they were trying to figure out and we're have, talking with people about how to get loans to small scale farmers in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So they're starting to talk yeah. about that. Yeah. So yeah, Good. the beginnings are there. All right, questions? So wait for the mic. Okay. Here, you're getting one. Okay, thank you. I want to address this. My name is Alfonso Diaz. I don't know how to describe myself, but <laughs> expert on mangoes. <laughs> but uh, as a consumer, I mean. Uh, <laughs> the, no, seriously. Well, I, I think you know that there is the best mango is actually called Alfonso. If <laughs> you, no, you, I didn't. <laughs> well, <she knows>. yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, from India, correct? Yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, I want to address this question to Dr. Sanchez. Um, and uh, somehow touch upon the issues raised by, by the other two uh, panelists about the, the input of uh, economics, uh, how to, what kind of model, uh, because somehow I got the taste, I'm an economist, by, by, just by training, I forgot that thing, but uh, uh, how do they go about the, the, the comparative advantage? I know that it might sound like uh, to capitalists, to them, and, and as opposed to old-fashioned uh, economic policy, which was designed by a, by a physician, you know, whom I'm talking about, Che. So uh, how, how, don't you think that all the ideas that you are uh, proposing somehow um, stick with the idea that you can do uh, you can be every 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 everything to everyone that uh, may be, or don't you think that there are some things that oh, no, the, the ones the 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 crops and the the possibilities of, that do touch that might be they might be better off by importing them and maybe concentrating in 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 in, in some stuff that which they are really really good. Take for example uh, Peru for mango or. And, and aqua, aquaculture, I, I suggest uh, another panel for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. No, I, I think your, your point, Alfonso, is, 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 is very good. Um, in, even in food security, that doesn't mean, food security is not equal food self-sufficiency or food <laughs> sovereignty in which you have to produce everything. 
No, you do it with the market. But I think 80% importing food is a bit too much. And, and especially, it's, it's a lot too much. <laughs> and especially, there is no, other than the traditional cigars and uh, uh, tobacco products and, 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 and sugar cane, a little bit that there is now, there isn't much exportation going on. Uh, by all means, they should export everything that has uh, a, a possible comparative advantages, like this, the, this uh, mangoes, if, 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 if indeed they have a comparative advantage. Uh, so I think that's why I'm thinking of, of more niche products, more uh, products for higher, higher levels of, of economic, uh, higher levels of wealth. Um, still, I mean, their, their countries have produced no agriculture. Singapore, it's a first world country. <laughs> and that island is so small, there's no agriculture. Saudi Arabia and, and these Gulf states that are very rich, they have very limited agriculture, and they import everything. They export petroleum, they import everything. Singapore exports knowledge, and they import everything. But uh, an agricultural country, I think should should take advantage of its great uh, enormous resource that it has. It's just like the United States may be very advanced in just about everything, but still this is a huge agricultural country. So uh, so um, so I th I think you you got to get that base, and if you don't have that base solid, especially is is so much of your land is just sitting there, um, the opportunity cost of that is huge. So. Yeah, uh, for sure. If you don't have the comparative advantage, by all means, uh, if it's better to import than to produce, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But the issues that I'm talking about are fairly straightforward to produce. Now, there's lack of labor, and that's a big problem. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> but, I, but I hope it's, first, we're not talking about food sovereignty or, or food self-sufficiency. Those are passé terms. Those are old terms. But we're talking about people being secure to be able to get food, whichever way, by growing it or by purchasing it at the right time and enough quality and so on. And that's, that's a problem now. Pedro, you, you mentioned the large amount of unused fertile land, and I think if I have the numbers right, it was between a quarter and almost one half of what is being almost used. Almost one half, yeah. yeah. And then you mentioned 80% of the food is imported. If the land that, how, how much is actually exported? I'm just trying to get the balance here. Uh, there are 11 million people, if I remember correctly. That's correct. So if you would use all the agricultural land, would would there be enough to get the food import down uh, to a, a small level? And, and would that be, as you mentioned, would that actually be desirable? Or how, how much are they exporting, actually, uh, compared to the imports? Is there even anything that would, would be close to, to starting to close the balance? Or are yeah. they you know, in such a big deficit of, of import versus export mm -hmm. that the whole... I'm just trying to get sort of the... the the budget the big picture. picture yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We don't we don't have that yet, and uh, we're having a meeting when we go there uh, under the Cuban Academy of Sciences, in which we'll be discussing different approaches to food security and what can uh, individual researchers bring forward, including economists. So we don't know. Uh, my gut feeling is is that uh, that you could, as you said, it's almost half half the land. Present agricultural land is 1.5 million hectares, and cropland, no cattle or anything else. And, uh, and, and this uh, new land is, let's say, a million hectares. So it's, it's getting pretty close to, pretty close to half. Um, I, haven't, I haven't done the numbers, uh, but I'm pretty sure that we could take care of most of the food security issues. Uh, without being totally independent or anything else. Wheat, for example, unless it's a miracle that they told me last week it works, we've got to keep importing wheat. And even if that works, it's going to be many years until it's, it's put to practice. So I don't have all the, all the right numbers to give you the, the picture that you have. Hopefully, we'll have that soon. Go ahead. Hi. 
Thank you. I have um, two questions. One's pretty straightforward and one's kind of a statement I'd like to see if you guys could respond to. And either Dr. Palmer or Dr. Sanchez um, can jump in on it. Or, or, or Jose, exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> the first one is about the um, bio fertilizers. Mm -hmm. And if the same problem of runoff uh, applies to those as it does chemical fertilizers, and if, it, if these bio fertilizers are as carbon intensive to produce as, as uh, chemical fertilizers, that's a straightforward one. The second one is, you know, we kind of have this 0.5 million hectares of blank slate land to go with, which is a really exciting opportunity. Um, but I can also think of a lot of ways, you know, with warming relations between the U.S. and Cuba of how to mess that up and e export bad habits, basically. And, um, you know, I guess how do you guard against... Um, a pre-1959-esque situation where most of the capital is owned by foreign entities. Um, and how do you um, make sure that you know the, the energy needs that they are looking for aren't filled by American, Canadian, or Mexican oil? Um, how do you... Um, I don't know. How do you, how do you um, make sure that uh, all the unsustainable ag um, issues aren't just exported to Cuba. Let Jose answer that last one. No, you go ahead. The, the, the first one, go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just, just getting a feel for the way people are thinking there without having talked to anybody higher than a minister. In other words, I haven't, we haven't talked with the, with the Ellison of of uh, people close to Raul Castro and, and so on. The, um, <clears throat> but without having talked to that, I see, I see a sense of uh, pride that will absolutely forestall any of those things. Uh, how far it goes, no. But, and, and I think we can say this as, uh, as Cubans, um, when during the Spanish-American War, where where, where the United States took Puerto Rico and the Philippines from Spain, they didn't dare to take Cuba <laughs> because Cubans were ready to fight back, even though it were totally, you know, it wasn't that good, that, that good of freedom. But, but Cubans are a little bit harder and very proud. And uh, I, at this point, I can't conceive of them succumbing to being another Puerto Rico or, or anything close to that. I think they'll put some pretty, uh, pretty strong, uh, pretty, pretty strong um, preventions against that. That's my feeling, and it's just a feeling. Can Jose chime but, in but on that? But answer the first question, the the the, the, bio the scientific. You, oh, you oh, the biofertilizers. Yeah, you want to do it? Yeah. So again, it's it's to look at these biofertilizers. So some of them are for fixing nitrogen, and that's again. It's hard to find the scientific evidence, but there's more and more on that type of research around the world, and it does seem to be happening. And you can fix fairly large amounts of nitrogen. So that takes enormous amounts of fossil fuels to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere to make mineral fertilizers. Um, the amount that could be produced biologically um, it's not clear that you could produce sufficient all the time. It could certainly serve as a huge substitution for nitrogen mineral fertilizer. And I think more and more as you see legumes coming into these systems again, I think um, that I think they're already taking advantage of that. But it's again, how do you scale those things? And I think a lot of it again is also economics. But it's certainly potential. Now the phosphorus ones and things like that, it's only making phosphorus more available. Phosphorus, you just don't get from the air. You're gonna have to bring it in somehow. Rock phosphate is allowed in organic agriculture because it's realized that you cannot grow foods with organic phosphorus sources. So, but it does make them more readily available, which helps on costs and, and things like that. It also can reduce pollution. Um, but if you have a lot of nitrogen fixing legumes, and we've had cases of this in Africa, you can fix 400 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare when you need about 100. And so that nitrogen is 
readily available for leaching as is a mineral fertilizer or for nitrous oxide emissions. So just because it's biological doesn't mean it doesn't contaminate the environment. Let me, yeah. I, I think you raise a great question and that's where you need economists involved. In right. um, clearly nobody wants to go back to a monoculture society where the rural sector is poor, illiterate, uh, where there's lack of, it's basically subsistence agriculture. On the other hand, I think if I look at, at, at agriculture around the world these days, I don't think the issue uh, is that there's too much investment. If anything, if you look at Mexico, Central America, the Dominican Republic, fairly inefficient agricultural systems, are the, the, there's a great need for investment. You compare that to Brazil, uh, state-led and Brapa, uh, very large uh, uh, agricultural fields, and then um, that's going to be the challenge. How do you how do you play with both of those um, and give the Cubans a a, a a central role in their own development? At the same time, where do you find the money? Is this you know in in, in Brazil you've had the government taking charge of the of the agricultural development. Uh, but that took a long time, and that took a lot of money. And the question is, where is that going to come from? That's sort of the economic central question that I think needs to get mm -hmm. resolved. Yeah, Others? Except Gabriel. He uh, knows a lot. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. Oh, please. Then we should probably break in about five minutes. All right, thanks. Personally, I think you have a unique opportunity. You have an open ear because of the grammar you master which is the technical grammar of knowledge and know-how. What your role should be is not only to be facilitators of knowledge, but literally translators of politics, economics, and culture at the same time. These are two countries that have not spoken to each other for many years. And oh, the way in which the message is delivered is crucial. Having worked on the issue in Cuba today, uh, the emphasis, of course, on the one hand is on production, but the key issue is what they call, and many people call, of course, the cycle of sustainable agriculture. Key elements are missing in Cuba. To answer your question, there is no export of food, substantially. But what's the problem? The problem is that the 80% number that you gave is absolutely correct, but we don't ask the causes for that number. The causes for that number fall back into the, into the chain. Cuba has an Artemisa, uh, a new create, newly created province in 2011. It's a, a pilot project for that. Has a, a storage facility called Acopio, mm -hmm. as, all of you, as you know for sure. Acopio is a major problem in Cuban agriculture because it substantially centralizes production. Goods are stored in not non-optimal facilities, and then distribution gets slowed down. So Acopia is a major problem, uh, which has been addressed in two pilot projects, in Artemisa and Mayabeque. And the other elements are missing in Cuba. It's distribution, it's a crucial uh, weakness, because, as uh, Charles mentioned, lack of resources. Uh, marketing, it's a crucial issue. When we speak about exporting goods, outside of Cuba, how do you actually brand a product? How do you transmit it outside of the, it's not sufficient to bring it to the Mariel. How do you bring it from the Mariel into the uh, stores and shops of each Walmart? Or right. if you want to be neoliberal Walmart, if you want to be more, uh, whatever, to another, uh, less, uh, <coughs> let's say Whole Foods. <coughs> uh, there is no wholesale market in Cuba. And that's a crucial deficiency. If you want to, as a farmer, if you want to have barbed wire, you need to either buy it at the state-run market or on the black market. Uh, private enterprise, it's a crucial uh, issue in Cuba. It's called, as you well know, cuenta propismo, which means being on one own's account. It was seen as a, as a necessary evil by Fidel in 1993. Today, it's been recognized and acknowledged, but still is not given enough strength. What will your role be? That is the crucial question. Thus, not to say in the Adam Smithian fashion that uh, 
private enterprises, uh, it's geared by the invisible hand of the market because that's, of course, not true. We know that today. But still, how to convey part of the message? I think that is the crucial uh, element. And one of the ways is to talk about the cycle and identify through that cycle the different strategic weaknesses that Cuba has. And that is a way in which that translation can occur because Cubans are ready to hear that. If you only focus on production and export, the two ends of the pipeline, the rest yeah. gets lost. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be a, a big shame. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You, have, you want to react to that? Or? No, then we have, we should probably quit in like two minutes. Two minutes, we're... OK. Uh, any other questions? So burning questions. It ends at six. Ends at oh, six. sorry. Yeah. Pardon, okay. pardon I see, me. Uh, I see a one burning question in the back. Fine. Yeah, no. Okay, great. Uh, hi, my my question is directed at um, man, the manpower challenge in helping Cuba maximize the crop yield. So, as Dr. Pedro and Dr. Palm you mentioned, um, it's very labor intensive in Cuba for planting things and making food crops. Um, how does the Cuba authorities react? Like you mentioned that there is a lot of young people moving away from agriculture. So what is the current measures to like ensure that there's adequate manpower and in the future? Like what what ways do you think Cuba can do to like ensure that there's enough people to carry on with the agriculture? Thanks. Yeah. Let me say that at this point we know the problems but we don't know the solution. We know the opportunity of, of plenty of empty land. But we also know that, that uh, Cubans finishing high school are very unlikely to go into agriculture. Okay? And they don't have any, any, any background. So you're going to have to sell agriculture. There's an agrarian university in Havana <clears throat> that is almost empty. He told me there are other agrarian universities across, across the country that I think are in better shape. But, but right now, big problem is how do we get, how, how do you incentivize um, young people to get back into agriculture? That is a problem. I have no solution whatsoever yet. But that is a problem. Cheryl, if you want to say. Yeah. You know, the, the, the issue of manpower uh, has been around for a long time. Um, you know, sugarcane cutters in Cuba, a lot of them came from Jamaica, came during the harvest and went, went back home. And so that's always been an issue. Let me, let me go back to something. I think what something uh, Mr. Vignoli just mentioned sparked. Tell us, in some ways, you, there's, there's an opportunity here for U.S. universities. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. huge. Uh, and it, it's an opportunity that's non-ideological, right? Where you can bring some really, you know, important value added, and perhaps with a combination of not so much U.S. Tr you know trained uh, economists, or, or but you know the example of Chile as to talk about uh, comparative advantage in terms of agriculture. The example of, of Brazil. Is there is there a role here for? Uh, U.S. universities, U.S. Uh, centers, uh, either alone or together with uh, other Latin American institutions to try and, and and bring that knowledge. And you know, Cubans will figure it out. But but mm -hmm. one of the things you can do is is bring some of the best practices out there. Yeah. So th that's why I started my points about the role of research and, and interchange of ideas and students. Students are the best way to get things moving, I think, and then you bring the professors in. Mm -hmm. But So I do think that's a huge role, and I think it's a very exciting role. Um, and so the, Columbia has a series of global centers, um, and one of their purposes is to actually help dialogue happen in an academic situation where it's not a political but it's to get dialogue going on topics such as, as those. How do you get a market system going in a place that hasn't, doesn't have markets basically and things like that. Where it's ideas and experiences 
you bring in people from Chile or, or people like that. So I do think Colombia, and, and they've asked, Colombia said, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about agriculture, not a Colombia global center yet, but start talking about agriculture. And I think we should really try to take advantage of it. And when we're there, I think we could ask them what kinds of seminars or discussions I'd like to have. And I, I think that's an excellent opportunity, especially with young people involved to start learning new ideas that they haven't been exposed to. If I may piggyback, because it's just on your topic, your two home institutions have affiliations with the University of Havana, Columbia University, uh, together with Dartmouth, and another seven Ivy League colleges mm -hmm. and universities has an intensive study in Havana program mm -hmm. in the spring and the fall mm -hmm. uh, for undergrads at this level. Yeah. I'm going to lead new school graduate students in the summer of next year, uh, and ELAS. Here, Colombia has grants for Cuban scholars to come and work for an entire semester on their own research projects, which is crucial because that way you're mm -hmm. fostering exchange at the undergraduate level and at the yeah. senior academic level. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, of course, be fostering yeah. even more. I mean, I was just, just thinking, putting on my government hat yeah. now, there's, there's an opportunity here to bring together, to do something you might not be able to do back in Cuba, but I know that Colombia has economists here you know you can we know bring a few in, yeah <laughs> you can bring in those economists together with really of the of the you know pointy headed scientists right. and figure out a uh, on the agricultural sector um, please thank you so much for your talk today um, it was very, very interesting to hear your perspective and your visits. Um, my question actually relates very well to the previous subject of getting youth in, or young people or high school graduates back into agriculture. And the one thing I noticed as a former STEM science and technology teacher here, um, and then my experience this summer operationalizing a UAV program is the use of technology in agriculture, so ICT for ag. Um, and I was curious as to how you guys anticipate um, the role of technology in Cuba, particularly in the agriculture sector, but also um, what sort of model you think um, Cuba will follow? Will it be like Sub-Saharan Africa, where it went through the future phone and then to the smartphone, or will it follow perhaps more of a Brahma perspective, where it just leapfrogged straight to the smartphone? Um, and do you think that will impact this problem? We don't know yet. Uh, that's that's a problem that uh, you, you're asking a lot of very good questions, but we cannot give you a proper answer because this is this is very early models and so on. I think they're up they're up for grabs. Uh, what is so this is where we need a lot of dialogue. Now students, um, and maybe large amounts of students, to have to to register at the University of Havana, the Grand University of Havana, and other places like this. And, and, to, and to interact back and forth, yeah, by all means. What we have to make sure is that students speak Spanish, because that is the language. Uh, so other than that, everything else goes. But we don't want to get into a situation like, like during the, uh, <clears throat> the 60s, there were a bunch of students who were there to help cut sugar cane, and, the, and, this, and this sort of things. Um, uh, what we want is students to, do, to, to share the knowledge, and the knowledge that is badly needed. And, and Cuban people are very eager to learn. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of opportunities to, to teach and, and learn together. And we, in this country, we have a lot to learn from Cuba in terms of how to handle major crises and, and how you get up to your bootstraps, literally, and 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 uh, and solve some of these problems. So the the social capital in Cuba, I think, is very high, and so is the human capital. The social capital in terms of people getting together, and and so on. I think I think is very high. So so uh, we'll see. Um, I wish I could answer all these questions now. Can I just add? And some of the one of the reasons you can't answer it is that remember it takes two to salsa. Okay, so so you have you have, for example, and this is something we worked on when I was in government. You have an opening of the telecom sector. You know, right now Verizon can can set up a shop in 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 Cuba, and that was done purposely. It was done, you know, focusing on communications, getting the Cubans out of the 
this wall that had been built, right? Uh, but it requires the Cuban government to say to a Verizon, come and set up, set up and, and that hasn't happened yet. So far you've had, and this is some, sometimes this is lost in the, in the, in the rumble, you've, you've, you have a one-way monologue in terms of opening up. Somebody has to let Verizon in. Somebody has to let Microsoft in. And that has to happen. And so part of, uh, a lot of the, of the answer to your question, the most of the will not come from the Verizons of the world or the Washingtons of the world, will come from the Cubans themselves. And what will Cubans let? What kind of technology will they want? What will they allow? And that's, that's an open question. Any, any other questions? Mm -hmm. yeah, we have until Please. six. Peter. <clears throat> on, on the role of academia in all these questions that have been raised, you, you mentioned that you know, Cuba is a well-educated uh, country. So uh, does it mean that some of the more recent disciplines or quasi-disciplines that are very relevant to some of the problems have not yet developed, that the education is mainly in a more traditional disciplinary sense? Or what, what, what is missing to, to make sure that, that these things are sort of more aligned, which then would actually facilitate an easier exchange? between, you know, students and academics from other countries. Again, Peter, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Gabriel can help because he has has been around. One thing that certainly is, one thing that certainly sorry is lacking in Cuba is uh, IT knowledge. The latest technologies in everything but biochemicals and biomedicine. Uh, what is very interesting in Cuba is that they have found their own innovation, green medicine, green energy. Mm -hmm. It's an experimental site unique to the world. So it's about, again, managing to articulate a dialogue between these two different scholarships. Both are very valid. And of course, Cuban scholarship being state-centered is much more structured. Marxist-Leninism was taught until the early 2000s. And the way in which problems are conceived academically is different. Mm -hmm. You know, you create a problem and you, know, you, you find a solution to that problem. The, pro the way in which the problem is articulated conceptually is already pre-given. It's an a priori. Here you're taught to read the text, identify your own problem within the text, and then discuss it in a seminary style. The way in which the classes themselves are given is different. And thus the type of knowledge that is produced is different. There's a question back there. I thought I was there. sorry. I was giving the signals. <laughs> Some, somebody has a question back here. Uh, hello. Um, thank you much for your for talk. And uh, my question has to do. I have heard from uh, Canadian visitors to Cuba that um, like there's still a lot of state ownership. That even like uh, cattle are pretty much all state owned. So my question is, uh, is that totally true? And uh, also like uh, kind of how are the dynamics of property kind of what way do we see it uh, moving? I can take it. It's a okay. part of property. Yeah. So there has been some relaxation of all state ownership, and it's somewhat nuanced. So there are some parcels of land that farmers can farm for themselves. It's, I wouldn't say it's what we would call private property, but they, it is for them to use. And then there's a lot more in terms of cooperatives, where groups of farmers are given land, again given, for their use. And so it's moving away from just the whole state farm, but it's, it, it's not in the sense of private property. And a lot of agricultural reform requires clarity in what can be done with the land and how that land can be used, particularly if it's going to be used sustainably. People need to have clarity in what, what their use rights are for those. Maybe anybody else have? F just a question from a technical point of view. Do you see a difference in how, how the private farms approach agriculture and, and, and choosing which crops to grow versus the state-owned larger farms? Is there a difference? It's, it's a huge difference. And, and uh, I haven't spoken to a private farmer in Cuba yet. Uh, okay. And I would like to ask him yeah. that kind of question. But, it's supposedly the system is that you're allocated a certain amount of output that you're supposed to produce. Mm -hmm. 
And if you produce more than that, that's fine. You can sell whatever you want. Uh, but who makes the decision on which crops where? I'm not sure it's the private farmers. I, I think it's the state. So that in itself, it's a problem. But I think there'll be a, a long-term growth in, into this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's not going to be the, uh, let's say, the Brazilian or American model of decision making. It'll be something a little bit more constrained. And with time, uh, it, may, it may get to it. So the, the, the thing is, what advantages can we take up, those who are interested in food security, what advantages can we take from the state system? <laughs> and, and what changes should be made? Yeah. So it's, uh, I'm sorry about all this, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know answers to the questions, but I, I mean, you've got to be honest, we're just beginning. And, and you know, I, I think there's a role here, there's a, I mean, I, I would, if I were in your shoes, if I were in the Earth Institute, I'd bring some Cubans here and put them together with a bunch of people and put them in a room for a couple yeah. of days. Yeah. That'd be fun. That's what we could do. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Sir. We have, we have two more minutes, so go ahead. Sorry to abuse the mic, but I, I came all the way from Connecticut, so I did serve <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, interstate. <laughs> um, now I'm going to be a, a bit, uh, uh, how could I put it, uh, play the Cassandra. Uh, uh, I'm a bit amazed that um, Brazil, I used to be posted in Brazil in, in times of NATO, but uh, I did precisely in Brazil, I, I got to know Embrapa works, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I'm, I, I'm amazed that in 20, uh, maybe 25 years since they reestablished re uh, relations, they haven't come to a, a more a closer, uh, a, 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 a more practical a relation in the way of agriculture. Uh, uh, to what factor do you attribute that, or maybe the? You mean between uh, Brazil, and Brazil and Cuba? Cuba. In, in the way of transferring, uh, namely in the way of transferring technology. You have already mentioned the stubbornness of uh, of Commander uh, Castro, but uh, but it might it be also a factor that the Brazilians are, uh, are not that not that better than the gringos in that they don't want to transfer, uh, they are not very keen on transferring things that they might uh, uh, reflect in they losing business. In other way, they are not playing like the Dutch who are keen on transferring flower technology or even the Israelis. I remember my times in, in running the Israeli Colombian Chamber of Commerce. They were keen on, as long as it is business, uh, they, don't, they don't think too much about they taking the the, the, the the business why why Brazil why not Japan as well uh, have uh, been more they, I'm amazed that Cuba is not a, a, a agriculture an, an island of, of that size um, well let me, let me just <clears throat> I work a lot in Brazil and uh, I I don't think the Brazilian psyche is one that we're gonna go and help Cuba get out of there I and mean, transfer our technology. That's not the way they are. That's not their makeup. Uh, it's not that they want to keep things for themselves either. But but the the aggressiveness, uh, which is more of maybe an American trait that we want assertiveness. We want to do more. Um, Brazilians are not are not into, into that in general. They're much more laid back. Japanese, I can't tell. Uh, there, uh, I, I don't know. You may ask about the Chinese now, and, and uh, maybe there's more possibilities there. But, but it's, uh, this will not be. And I, and I think when Jose was saying, you know, if you have a bunch of students, then they all have to be Americans. They could be Brazilians. They could be Kenyans. They could be. I think that's better. But, but uh, anyway, enough for the Brazilian thing. That's my. My take on their psyche. Well, I think we've come to the end. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm, I, for one, as a Cuban American, I'm delighted that we have Pedro and Cheryl involved in this because they, the, these folks can, 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 can help a lot. So thank you. Thank you, you, both of you, for what you do. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, before closing, I just uh, wanted to also, uh, you know, extend my personal thank to the uh, to the speakers, and also. This was the second uh, seminar in the fall uh, series. We probably will have one more on a on an, a topic like either the the Enzo state or where are we heading this year with the global temperature? Because we most likely will set a new record, and you know how is all that hanging together, and what does it mean for issues such as agriculture and and uh, on, in a global sense, but also in in regional. Uh, context. Uh, so we will announce that as soon as we have lined up the, the speakers and so watch out for the announcement and I hope I will see you sometime in November. Thank you.